Welcome to the Energy Switch Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Tinker. For 40 years, I've been studying energy. We've worked hard to make this podcast something different. It's focused exclusively on the intersection of energy and climate. We dig deep with two world-renowned experts, often with differing opinions. We're nonpartisan, and we edit the conversations to be tight and content-filled. Enjoy the energy switch. There are many paradoxes in climate and energy. For instance, people want energy to drive their cars and heat their homes, but don't want any new power lines or pipelines to bring it to them. Nuclear is a zero-carbon energy source, yet many climate advocates oppose it. Some U.S. states impose EV mandates, but prohibit mining for battery metals. We'll examine these and other paradoxes with two experts in economics, energy, and climate policy. Dario Laguti is the Director of Sustainable Energy for the UN Economic Commission for Europe and a former Managing Director and Global Head of Finance for GE Capital. We are facing an uncertain future, so we need to embed flexibility in that policy. Climate change, energy transition is an international issue. And we are in a situation where actually international cooperation is breaking down. Roger Pilkey Jr. is a professor of environmental science at the University of Colorado, a former senior fellow at the Breakthrough Institute and author of three books on climate policy. Denying climate change is a problem, but blaming everything on climate change is also a problem. Right. And figuring out how do we keep our scientific institutions robust and secure in this political environment right. is going to be really important. I'm Scott Tinker, and I'm an energy scientist. Next up, energy and climate paradoxes and how we might resolve them. Energy and climate paradoxes. Look forward to chatting about some of them. Poor countries around the world, emerging economies, um, developing economies who don't have great energy security. It comes mm. and goes to them. They want to expand their energy use. The wealthy countries want to decarbonize. We're sometimes saying to them, you should decarbonize too. Is this a paradox? Well, you, you have to understand that, for, first and foremost, for them, energy is development. Right. It's not about energy transition because they're not transitioning <laughs> from, from poverty po to something else. Exactly. So they look at energy with two different hats. They're looking at the decentralized energy production, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. solar, mostly renewable energy in rural areas, for example, right. to right. provide a minimum of energy services to a population. Just getting started. And then you look, they're looking at developing their own industry, of course. Yeah. Uh, and there they're looking, of course, at, you know, coal and gas. You cannot say you just only develop uh, uh, renewable energies because that's not, that's not enough. They need the whole right. solution, the whole right. portfolio of technologies to Absolutely. develop. And that portfolio of technology needs to be adapted to their individual needs. It's complicated. So it's, co it's a complicated equation right. to, 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 to pull it through. And, I, and, and it's difficult to say you should be doing that. Actually not, we should be helping them in doing the right thing Sorry. by providing technology. One thing it's yeah. which here instead in, in the emerging market is particularly true is investment, it's capital. Mm -hmm. And that's where I believe we, the Western world should help them yeah. is by providing technology and investment because right. we are rich in, of both. That's right. Are the policies that we're trying to implement somehow hindering this development and growth, Roger? Or how do you see that? Yeah, I mean, here's another paradox. A lot, and I see a lot of this, there's a lot of well-meaning folks who are intent upon improving household energy access, electrification in very poor places. And on one level, that's great. It, it raises standards of living. But on the other hand, we're keeping people in poverty, but at a little bit more tolerable level of poverty. Right. And we have to realize that everyone around the world is striving for an economy with a 21st century infrastructure, from the roads in front of you to stores, to factories, to airplanes. And African countries, as you say, have noted this, again, a paradox, that many, many of those countries are rich in fossil fuel resources, but cannot access the capital to develop them, um, the institutions that are needed to govern them, and they actually they face opposition. And this does have the pernicious effect of countries that, that have contributed nothing to the climate problem, and even if they were to develop their fossil fuels would contribute you know, marginally a little more, are effectively being kept out of this, this path to development, which the rich parts of the world already took advantage right. of. Yeah. Nuclear. I mean, it's zero carbon source once it's built. You're reliable, uh, pretty affordable once it's built. A lot of climate advocates or those who are most concerned about climate, many of them are opposed to nuclear. What's the thinking here? I think, yeah, I think the, um, the discussion around nuclear is really about safety. Right. And uh, in the nuclear industry, because of this, this continuing 
attention on safety has actually the highest safety standards in the energy world. Yeah. How do we counter that fear? It's How education. I think okay. it's education. It's talking openly about that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's talking about data. It's talking about with numbers. Right. And it's today, it's, an, it's, a, it's a political decision. It's yeah. not really an economic or technological decision because certain countries are perfectly fine with nuclear, take France. Other countries are totally against nuclear, take Germany. And right. they're both, you know, close to each other. What's the difference between France and Germany? <laughs> it's a political issue. Language. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> Among it's other things, true. yeah. <laughs> true. And as well, cuisine. <laughs> That's right. But one of, one of the issues around nuclear, I think, is and that it scares a lot of people, well, it scares or, or concerns a lot of people is the, is the budget, right, and the time to build the nuclear, the yes. nuclear power plants. Because typically, they've been over budget and then you know, by many years delay. So I think, you know, the, the small uh, modular reactors probably, probably could help in assuaging that kind of, uh, uh, of uh, resistance from the population because they are a much smaller scale, they are easily, more easily deployable, they cost less. It's an, it's an the technology which is needs to, to be proven. Right. I think we also have to remember that worldwide, there's something like 420 nuclear power plants. Yeah. That's not very many. Yeah. The United Arab Emirates has committed to building um, a series of nuclear power plants which are coming in at successively lower costs. Yeah. So imagine a world where we committed to building 2,000 nuclear power plants. Mm. If it's like other technologies, like solar, like wind, sure. um, we would fully expect that if we developed a sizable industry, not these one-offs, that, that costs may come down. Even so, so you take the Vogel nuclear power plant in Georgia, um, which ha has recently come online. First nuclear power plant in the United States in decades. It was over budget, billions of dollars. There was court cases fought over it, a lot of money spent in trying to oppose it. Even with all those expenses and, and all those difficulties, there is cost certainty for Georgia residents to 2080 and beyond. Hmm. Um, and the, you know, the last thing I'll say is, is if climate change is indeed you know, the challenge of our generation, the challenge of our era, maybe it's okay we pay a little bit more for nuclear to ensure that we don't have uh, these unpredictable, unexpected impacts of climate change down the road. Right. You know, you said the Georgian residents will be will be assured of a price stability to 2080, right? Mm -hmm. But we have seen the impact of climate change last year on power plants, nuclear power plants in France, when suddenly yeah. you have issues, lack of water availability for right. cooling down power plants and lack of water for hydropower plants. Mm -hmm. And I think that is an issue that, you know, when planning and looking at the different technologies, one needs really to take into consideration because you might find yourself with an infrastructure that is it's not performing as sure. they were supposed to. And therefore, and I think, you know, diversification is the, is the name of the game because you don't know. <laughs> we're, we're walking into an, an era of uncertainty. And so if you deploy a wide variety of technologies, each one resilient to a different aspect in climate change, you can play that, that game. Yeah, you got to have you optionality. Will, you have, you got to have optionality. Listening to Dario's comments, it made me think, well, this is why natural gas is going to be around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Because natural gas provides a, a firm backstop that is less weather dependent um, and can be started and stopped quickly. Interesting. And the question is, well, then how do we, how do we pay for these backup technologies? How do we overbuild? Right. Um, and maybe that's a, a cost of society in a world with, with more variability and uncertainty going forward. But again, this is where wealthy countries can probably afford that yeah. backstop and redundancy. And, right. and you know, the only way for poor countries to be able to develop that same level of redundancy and robustness is to become wealthy countries. Right. And so we, how do we create a virtuous cycle where we're getting wealthy, we're cleaning up the energy system, we're creating redundancies so that the economy continue to, to go? That's, yeah. that's the challenge. Yeah. That's how we beat the paradox. So Canada was burning this summer, you know, a lot of fires. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of fires. And, and then go to the data and look at it acreage burn has actually been coming down the last 20 years. I mean, you've studied climate too. I mean, I hear that a lot, extremes. And then I look at data and I say, well, I don't see the extremes always. I mean, this seems like a paradox to me too, the paradox of communication. I think it is true that a lot of the discussion of extremes departs from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change yeah. and our consensus understanding. At the same time, climate change is real and it's, it, it is affecting things like yeah. fire weather and heat waves and so on. Denying climate change is a problem, but blaming everything on climate change is also a problem. Right. And figuring out how do we keep our in scientific institutions robust and secure in this political environment, right. especially for professionals who build things, um, is going to be really important.
So EVs, you know, we, uh, electric vehicles, they do require mining. Some states and other countries are mandating them, yet they won't do the mining. Mm -hmm. I guess the irony here or the paradox to me is still somebody's got to mine. China processes today all these metals, 80% of the key metals. What do you, how do you see this? Both the Europe and the U.S. have already taken important policy and important industrial decisions around that. I mean, the EU is proposing the EU Raw Materials Act, mm -hmm. which foresees a minimum, it mandates a minimum of domestic production mm. of the raw material, a minimum of domestic processing capacity, and a minimum of recycling capacity. We actually attach now in Europe to every EV battery a digital passport. Mm -hmm. That digital passport tells you exactly where the components are coming from, what is the supply chain, and how you're going to dispose them. Interesting. But coming back to the mining thing that yeah. you mentioned, first and foremost, we need, first of all, to, to learn where are these reserves. Because right. I can tell you one thing, and you're a geologist, yeah. you know better than me this. Yeah. We haven't been looking for we those things for over the last, for, for <laughs> a while. We've yeah. been looking for all sort of other things, right. not, not for those things. But another thing is, we have mining methodologies and processes which haven't really changed. No, they haven't. It's one of the industries where there's no artificial intelligence, really, not yet enough. You don't have a lot of other concerns around, you know, you know how you diminish your... They are starting now, mining companies, to take into consideration these aspects. Yep. So certainly, I think there is scope to improve our mining operations. If you can start with modules, you know, and then in, in minimize that impact. Of course, there will be right. an environmental impact. Certainly, it's mining operation. You're, you're, you know... I've never had anybody say it's really green, but... You, you can do a lot better. That's, okay. that, 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 that's right. exactly the point. Yeah. And so that will go towards you know, some of the concerns of the people that they don't want that in the backyard. Yeah. You know, there's an acronym, BANANA. Yeah. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. Yeah. And that, that is an operating <laughs> philosophy in many places, particularly in the United States, where we want all the benefits of modern energy services and modern energy supplies, but none of the costs, and certainly not in my backyard. Right. So, so again, this is one of those paradoxes. It's, it's a challenge. And every time I see protests against any kind of um, natural resource extraction, that's not gonna reduce the use of materials. It means that they're gonna be sourced from somewhere, somewhere else. else. And yeah. that means some other economy is gonna benefit or we're going to increase our, our exposure to you know, bad actors right. or, or pressure. And, so, may, and it may not be done as well, either right. human it's, rights or environmental. That's exactly, that, right. that's exactly right. Do we have anything analogous to this EU uh, Raw Materials Act uh, coming or existing, do you know? No, I haven't seen anything yeah. like that in the United States um, yeah. proposed, and it is an interesting approach, um, certainly for, for right. energy security purposes. Right. Yeah. Um, in the United States, a, a lot of the debates are more about what should we ban next, and that seemed to me to be a very positive, forward-looking approach right. um, that recognizes that, yeah, we're going to have to take our medicine. We're banning and, a lot, yeah, mining yeah. and pipelines. Yeah. And, the, and the, the, another aspect of that, of that act, which I think is interesting, is obviously Europe is not as rich as the U.S. And so the EU has signed some of these strategic partnerships. Is with Congo, the, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, with Ukraine, with Kazakhstan, which are rich in some of these critical minerals. Right. And the beauty about that is that the same standards that you apply in Europe will have to be applied in those minerals that are part of that agreement. Here's another paradox. Um, you know, U.S. states and probably countries too, I could think of, are kind of meeting their goals, if you will, by importing electrons and fuels and products and not producing them there. There's only one atmosphere. How do we get... What? What yeah, do we I mean, do there? It, it, it's an age-old problem in public policy is that when you set targets, they become subjects to be gamed through accounting. Right. This has always been a problem with using emissions as the measure of success for climate policy. Emissions are an outcome. What we really want to do is reduce the amount of burning of fossil fuels, or at least unmitigated fossil fuels. I mean, one of the reasons we don't do that is it creates a degree of political accountability. Um, it, it's not just uh, you know, individual states, politicians and, and, and advocates like these games too. Um, carbon offsets are a perfect example. Um, so you can give the Im impression of making progress um, when the reality is a little mm -hmm. bit more complicated. So I, I think yeah. adopting policy targets that are much more closely associated with the nature of the problem we're trying to address yeah. reduces, and you'll never get, eliminate the, the, the gamesmanship in accounting, but we can reduce the scope right. for playing those games. I hadn't thought about it that way, uh, Roger. I, I, to be honest with you, I, 
I've always thought about, well, it's not the fuels that are the problem, it's the emissions that are the problem. It, it kind of proceeds in parallel track. If we had carbon capture and storage or carbon capture and utilization mm -hmm. at scale, mm -hmm. and that was available, then indeed it would be about the emissions, because then right. we, that's a direct, uh, but we don't have that at scale. And so sure, let's pursue those technologies right. in parallel, but until we do so, reining in um, the demand for fossil fuel worldwide is probably a much better focus than saying, well, let's just focus on this output, which is emissions, because that's gonna more directly address yeah. a whole suite of issues, not just the climate issue. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really think, I, I agree with Roger, and it really think it's about energy consumption. Yeah. It's the energy huge... intensity of our society. It it's is. It's way too uh, energy intensive, our society. We well, know this. this is another paradox. The yeah. paradox is, it, there, there is no scenario of the future where, where the world does not use vastly more amounts of energy. But at the same time, we want the, the, the energy intensity of the economy to go down dramatically yeah, at the yeah. same time. Right. And so we're trying to do two things at once. And I think that often gets confused in debates where people say, well, we should be using less energy. And that's, you know, that's fine for those yeah. of us who are energy rich, but when you realize there's billions of people who yeah. have almost none, um, yeah. the, the world as a whole is just going to go up and it's up with up. air conditioning, with jets and travel. Yeah. And so, so that's the world we have to prepare for. Um, look, we, speaking of electricity, we love energy, but electricity, but we hate pipelines. We hate power lines. We, uh, but we need them. We need infrastructure. Well, this is a paradox. Are we, are we going to have to learn how to embrace some infrastructure? If you want to have a, a, a centralized or a relatively centralized energy system, you will have need, we will need a lot more electricity networks, yeah. for sure. Investment in grid is the real bottleneck today to the deployment of solar and, mm -hmm. and wind at a massive scale. Mm -hmm. There are very few manufacturers in the world that are able to produce those high voltage uh, cables. And then certainly there's the issue that not in my, in, in my backyard, right? right? And which is a, which is an, a very important which issue. Which we now learn is banana. So. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. NIMBY becomes banana. Exactly. And pipelines too. I mean, we won't build new pipelines yeah. here. I mean, we see this in New England, in the United States. Um, it, it, you know, New England, um, north of Pennsylvania, is close to some of the, the, the most accessible shale reserves in the world. Sure. And, um, you know, during winter uh, last year, people were bur burning oil. Yeah. For, for heat, um, which makes no sense. Uh, and that's partly a, you know, a, a, what you call an own goal, that you know, by, by refusing to build the infrastructure necessary to move energy resources from one place to another. The natural gas out of the Marcellus, for exactly, example. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, we wind up burning a, a much dirtier, more polluting fuel, right. because that, people aren't gonna go cold. Right. So, so this is an et et eternal problem. Um, and I do think it's, it is a luxury of rich countries to um, have all the energy resources you want and then simply oppose everything, which basically means we lock ourselves into the status quo. So in this emissions and other things, what are the pros and cons of a carbon tax? A carbon tax is, um, at some point, is absolutely necessary if we're going to achieve deep decarbonization. Um, what a carbon price, carbon tax, a carbon fee can do is it can raise an enormous amount of resources to fund technological innovation um, and deployment, um, not just in the United States, but around the world. Right. For example, a $5 a ton carbon tax, that raises about $150 billion around the world. And, and the idea behind that is, is, it doesn't matter where you start, but start low. Yeah. And then use a, at least some, I mean, p politicians will siphon off some of that money for whatever they want to do. But as fossil fuels go down in their proportion of the global economy, it becomes politically easier to ratchet up that price. We have yeah. a tax on nuclear waste and it has siphoned, all been siphoned off, yeah. we haven't done anything with it. The, the skeptics might say, oh, another new tax. Yeah. The example I use is the US Highway Trust Fund. Yeah. So every time you put gas in your car, you're, you're paying a tax that goes into the Highway Trust Fund. When you're driving around, you see the, the orange cones and that's employment. People are working, they're building infrastructure. Um, is some of the highway trust funds siphoned off for other purposes? Of course it is. Mm -hmm. But that is, that is the, I would say, the single most popular tax that the U.S. government has had in the last half century because they see the benefits of that tax every year. Right. And so if we create a, a, a virtuous cycle in energy where you know, the promise isn't you're going to see benefits in 2100, but no, we're going to invest this in communities, and we're going to have research institutes, we're going to actually have deployment projects for, you know, 
name your favorite technology in local places right. and create jobs, that's when I think it becomes more of a virtuous political circle. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with what Rod just said. But one of the issues around carbon taxes is that it has a, a, an asymmetrical impact on your industry and your, and your cost of living, if not applied everywhere. Right. And so what you have to do is we just, you have to start with different levels of carbon taxes depending on mm -hmm. where your, your economic development mm -hmm. uh, level is, right? You right. can't put a, a $50 carbon tax in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. That doesn't make, you know, make sense at all. Right. That's why you have to think about, it's not all about energy transition, it's about the just transition. Yes. I mean, I think the social aspect and social acceptance of the energy transition has been under evaluated yeah. and under considered. And yeah. I think now people are start realizing that if you don't have social acceptance of the energy transition, you won't have an energy transition. Right. Look, we've talked about lots of things that are, that are paradoxical, if you will. Give me some final thoughts. Roger, if you don't mind, I'll just start yeah. with you. Yeah. You know, I think one thing you know, this conversation brings out is we need a better policy approach to create a level playing field that's technology blind. Usually what people will do is say, well, we need more regulations for those technologies I don't like, <laughs> and we need more subsidies for those that I do. Yeah. And then we get this mishmash of policies where, you know, coal is not treated the same as nuclear and wind and solar are treated differently than natural gas. And, you know, in any plausible scenario of the future, we're going to have a wide range of technologies that are deployed, including fossil fuels, but recognize that fighting against energy um, is, is pretty punitive for a lot of people around the world. Right. So having a positive outlook on how do we provide the energy services that people demand, that people need, um, while at the same time trying to balance it, these other goals. I think, you know, I, I am actually very optimistic about the future and, and how we'll be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, not least because there are billions of people around the world demanding that we do that. And so um, if we can take some of the negativity and politics out of energy policy debates and, and instead focus on, all right, let's, let's get our minds together. And, you know, we're going to make a lot of mistakes and things aren't always going to work out. But as long as we're moving incrementally, we might see outcomes like we see in feeding the world mm -hmm. and improving public health around the world, which are tremendous success stories over the last century. Yeah. So maybe at the end of this century, we look back and we say, you know, energy, energy was the one of the 21st century that we really made a lot of progress yeah. on. Yeah, I like that optimistic thinking and technology blind. Yeah. Final thoughts? Think, yeah, uh, two, two things. I think policy making needs to be flexible. Mm -hmm. We are facing an, uh, uh, an uncertain future. So when you do, when you make, you take a decision today, you don't know whether that decision will be as good as you think it's today, tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow. So we need to embed flexibility in that right. policy. Allow for learning. Allow for learning. change. Right, especially because the future is very uncertain. Yes. And that's a diversification, great point. you know, okay. uh, technology mixes, complex options, create options, that's the way forward. Right. The second point, and I have to do that, is international cooperation. Mm -hmm. Climate change, energy transition is an international issue. It, ha cannot, it doesn't know any boundaries. Yeah. And we are in a situation where actually international cooperation is breaking down. Yeah, just one atmosphere. Exactly. International cooperation has never been as important as it is today. Interesting. Look, I appreciate your thoughts and, and really enjoyed our visit today. Thank um, you. And your knowledge and expertise is terrific as always. Governments and markets need to solve many energy challenges, of which climate change is only one. Sometimes these challenges may be at odds with each other such as the need to provide more energy while simultaneously emitting less. Solutions will be imperfect and may best work regionally. We should expect some failure and look for compromise. We'll need to accept that no energy is perfect, which may mean embracing solutions that are not universally popular, like nuclear, new mines for renewable energy minerals, new pipelines, and new power lines. Carbon reduction goals are most likely to succeed if they're technology agnostic open to whatever does the job, recognizing internal conflicts, increasing transparency, and prioritizing education will help policymakers and the public minimize these energy and climate paradoxes. Energy Switch is executive produced by Scott Tinker and produced and directed by Harry Lynch. Emily Hooks is the assistant producer and researcher. Editors are Ginny Patrick, Yusef Swachina, and Jackie Kunzler. Matt Aslanian does the sound. 
Energy Switch is produced by Arcos Films for the Switch Energy Alliance with support from the University of Texas at Austin and EarthX.